strokes are going to keep trickling in. But I just want to start right at 530 because we're here. Why not? I'm not going though. Muted the YouTube. Um, so I'm Taylor Roden. I'm the community events manager here at Historic Seattle, um, and we save meaningful places to foster lively communities. That's the business that we're in. So thank you so so much for joining us for History Collective, Seattle Central Waterfront. Um, slide. Historic Seattle. Um, in addition to saving our spaces and fostering lively communities, we know that our property and our programs occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. And this acknowledgement is not a substitute for developing relationships with indigenous communities or for honoring indigenous stories as we share our collective history, but it's a first step in recognizing the people whose land we do occupy. I have a few thank yous um, before we get into tonight's program. So first I wanna thank um, all of our panelists and we'll I'll introduce them in just a second. And especially want to thank our sponsors for making our education programming possible. So thank you to Daniel's Real Estate, Greystone Lodge, and the Greystone the Lodge at St. Edwards Park. Thanks to Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers Local 1 in Washington and Alaska. And thank you to Folly Construction. And I also want to extend a huge thank you to History Link and Friends of Waterfront Seattle for partnering with us for this edition of History Collective. Definitely couldn't have done this without you all. So major kudos. Um, and a plug to History Link. So they've got all of these self-guided walking tours. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to take this tour or really check out any of them, I will share that information after this event via email with all of you who registered. Um, and a pro tip, so our friends at Waterfront Seattle actually curated Waterfront Vibes and Audio Fantasy. So if you want to listen to good music while you're taking this tour, I'm not gonna stop you. I think it's a good idea. And then of course, thanks so much to our panelists for being here. So thank you, Chairman Leonard Forsman. Thank you, Jordan Remington, Guy Michelson, and of course, Jennifer Ott. Um, and before we hear from our panelists um, for the actual discussion, Jennifer is actually going to kick us off with an overview of the tour and do some framing of uh, tonight's discussion. Um, and then after Jennifer does that, We'll do the Q and or we'll do the panel, and then we'll end our time together with a Q and A. So throughout this presentation or this conversation, not a presentation, um, definitely invite you all to put all of your um, questions in the chat. I'll look at that after the conversation or uh, throughout the conversation, and just keep track. And I promise that I'll try to get to as many of your questions as I can um, with the time that we have. And before Jennifer. Um, comes on the screen to, to give us the overview of the tour. I just want to remind all of us that our points of view and our opinions will differ, and that's great. We're all different people. That's why we love these conversations. So we just ask everyone present be respectful of the space for listening, for learning, and for exploration. We really want um, and have created a safe space for all of our participants. And if that kind of shared agreement is not being uh, honored, then we'll take action. But I don't think that's going to happen tonight. So with that, please welcome Jennifer Ott. Jennifer is um, the author of the tour to do some framing before we get into this really awesome discussion. Great. Thank you so much. And um, you all can see my screen just right. Yes. Thank you. So thank you so much for having me and thank you for to everyone for joining us. Um, I'm, uh, I've been writing about the waterfront for many years. I, I'm, my background is I'm an environmental historian and I uh, love to explore how people shape their environment and how they are shaped by their environment. And so I'm going to start this evening with, or, or start our evening with talking about how um, massive transformations have come to the waterfront largely in response to changes in technology. Not 100%, and we're kind of in a new era now, but this is, it's kind of an interesting way to frame this. And um, I have this video that was put together by the Water Lines Project people. Um, and the, the Water Lines is from the Burke Museum. And it's an animation of the transformation of our central waterfront, um, focused yeah. on the uh, Pioneer Square area. And you'll see that this is today, um, although it's already changed since this was made, 
And then we're peeling back the layers of what the built environment looks like. And so you can see the water is emerging. The original landscape is emerging. Uh, we're getting smaller and smaller. Last sailing ship is gone. And we're back to time immemorial, which goes back to at least when the last glaciers came through here and shaped this landscape that we know. And um, this little vill this village, little crossing over place, um, the ZZ Lalich in Lushootseed, is um, was the village that was located at what we know of as Pioneer Square today. And um, it's a pretty radical transformation. That uh, long stretch of um, straight ground on the left side of the lobe, that about lines up with First Avenue today. And the um, southernmost or the leftmost part of that lobe about lines up with King Street today. Just to give you a sense of um, how much land we've actually built in Seattle on the waterfront. And um, this is another map to kind of get you oriented to sort of the post-glacial conditions on the central waterfront. This is a map made in 1841 by the Wilkes Expedition. And you can see Elliott Bay with that tremendous estuary at the southern end, the lower end of the image. Um, Piner's Point, which is what he called the area was where Zizi Lalich was. And up north, there is the original configuration, at least at the time that uh, the non-Native people were exploring this area. That is what the landscape looked like. The Smith Cove area was um, truly a cove. And so this is a focus up there on um, Piner's Point. And you can see there is the solid ground. There's the marshy area. The marshy area is about where Washington and Maine are today. And then you'll notice that the water goes all the way to the rise of the hill on the far right there. And that's the edge of Beacon Hill today. So think of all of those acres that had to, have been filled in the time since. And Native people that have been here since time immemorial um, did not need to transform the beach. And I do not mean to imply at all that Native people did not change the landscape. They certainly did. But what we're talking about in that era is things that are of a smaller scale and that are more attuned to how the landscape actually worked. And so you have things that um, shaped fishing areas or that cultivated plants um, and the conditions that they would do the best in. Um, but you don't see the large scale earth moving um, efforts that you'll see in later years. And so one of the biggest reasons for that is that most travel in this area was done via water. They were the canoe highways, because if you think of the lowlands being a bit swampy most of the time and the uplands being covered with thick forests, then you can see how uh, the waterways would be far superior for getting around. And the canoes do very, very well with the beach access. They slide right up and there's, there's a co-evolution there of the landscape shaping design and um, the responding to the conditions. And so after you have non-native settlers come here in the 1840s and 1850s, you start to see the introduction of a different expectation. Uh, you see the sailing ships there on Elliott Bay and in the foreground that is that, um, that lagoon area that goes behind um, and up into Pioneer Square, where, where Pioneer Square is today. And so those sailing ships need something very different. They need um, deep water access. They can't belly up to the beach. They have to have a pier that goes out to them. If you're going to have things to put onto those ships, because the goal is to have trade, then you have to have piers, you have to have level land in order to be able to manufacture things or even to process things. If you want to um, have a sawmill, you cannot do that on the hillside very well. And so you need to create or build uh, level land. And so you start to see that um, grow out and then you start to see the steamships that come uh, on the upper right here, you see much larger scale ships and you get further development of the waterfront. And then in the lower image, those are the Mosquito Fleet steamers. Those are those smaller boats that skitter all over um, at Puget Sound and Hood Canal and carry people before there aren't very many roads that can be used to um, move in the area. 
the canoe highways became steamer highways essentially. And so um, you have all these facilities being built on Elliott Bay to serve those passenger um, vessels. And so what you see here is this is that map we were looking at on the left here from 1841. And on the right, you see a map from 1913, which is just not that long. And you see some of this is aspirational, but most of it is in place. And you can see all of those, they're called finger piers because they look like little fingers sticking out. And they are, it's basically a solid wall of piers stretching from about where Denny Way would come down and hit the water all the way down and around to West Seattle. And uh, you have waterways, you have a tremendous fill, not all of it is filled by 1913, but the estuary has been completely transformed. And this is all into response to having those larger ships and the ability to move more resources at a larger scale and then shaping the landscape to meet that need. Um, you have another technology that is shaping the landscape, uh, the trains that are moving the goods from the inland areas to the shoreline to meet up with those ships. Um, you have uh, t up to 12 sets of railroad tracks going along the waterfront um, in the peak years. And those are all moving north and south because they can't just come up and over the hills from Lake Washington, although it would be hilarious to see a freight train do that. Um, instead, they have to come either from the, I talked with my hands and I'm realizing you can't see them. Um, they either have to come around via the inner bay area to reach it via level land, the waterfront from level land, or they have to come south through the Duwamish River waterway. And so you have this north-south movement. And so this is a tension that will be part of the reason that the water the waterfront evolves the way that it does is that you have things and people moving north and south and you have things and people moving east and west. And um, you see the um, horse and wagons, those will be replaced by vehicles very soon. And um, it's, it's remarkable when you read the newspapers from this era, there are so many gory stories of trains starting unexpectedly and the people that get trapped by that because it's insanity to have these people sharing this, these different modes of transportation sharing this space. And then you have the onslaught of the vehicle. And I'm sorry, this isn't a great um, quality of image, but I love this image so much that I used it anyway. This is the ferry letting out the traffic at Coleman Dock. Before there are lanes marked, there are no traffic signals and there is not um, any sort of sort of agreed upon road rules to manage this sort of onslaught of traffic. And I should add that this entire area, both that we're seeing here and here, none of this is solid ground. All of the flat areas are um, trestles. Uh, they're built on pilings and um, it's just entirely a city built out over the beach because again, you need level land in order to be moving people and goods at this scale and with these modes of transportation. And so in the 1930s, 1934, they start building the seawall and that's a whole nother long fascinating story. But the person here that you see in the upper left, he is standing where the sidewalk is today. And so that gives you a sense of the scale of transformation from beach to solid ground. And so they move the edge of the shoreline out to the edge of the seawall um, and then fill the entire area back behind and raise it to a level point, even with about Western Avenue. You would think that that might've solved some of the transportation issues, but it did not. So you see that um, it became a parking place. It became a throughway. Um, it's way easier to drive on the waterfront than it is to go second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth Avenue. Um, there's no freeway and there's no 99 yet. And so it instantly became a bit of a choke point and the uh, waterfront businesses begged the city to come up with a plan B for what to do next. And that's when we got the viaduct, which it's so much more fun to give this little presentation now because it used to be that we never thought the viaduct would go away and then it did. So now it is gone, but the viaduct served a very specific purpose and it represented a different set of values than maybe we have today about land use and um, access and all sorts of things like that. And so the viaduct was built in the 50s and 60s. Uh, over a few years, it um, opened up in stages. 
and it dominated the waterfront until today. We are now in the process of developing this waterfront. And this waterfront, unlike the one that was adapted to canoe use or the sailing boats or the steamships or the steamers or the automobile or the railroads is much more focused on human scale uses. However, there still is a big road that comes through and um, the piers are still there, but to a much less of an extent. And there is a greater um, priority placed on the environmental values and the environmental uses and on providing space for multiple communities to have access for use. And that will come out in a lot of different ways. And so it's very interesting to see the evolution of this space over time. It's almost impossible to imagine that it all happened, but it did. And so um, that was my whirlwind tour of the waterfront. And I hope you all have enjoyed the tour very much. And I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Jennifer, um, for that framing. And I just realized that when I said your names, I didn't actually let people know um, what you do. So I'm going to spot myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I know that you all are going to do like very fun and interesting self introductions, but I had in my notes to actually like read all of that stuff. And then I just was so excited and went off script, which is not the thing that we're doing. So. Hi, Jennifer is uh, the assistant director and historian at History Link. Jennifer obviously authored the Seattle Central Waterfront Tour. Jordan Remington, thank you, Naomi, for uh, spotlighting everyone, is the community engagement and programs coordinator at Friends of Waterfront Seattle. Chairman Leonard Fordsman is the tribal chairman of the Suquamish Tribe. And Guy Michelson is the principal landscape architect at the Burger Partnership. This is our. Hi, thank you all so much for being here. Um, so I'm just gonna dive right into our discussion questions. Um, and I may skip around because some of these are really, really good and I selfishly want to hear very specific answers, but I'll start with the first one that I sent you. Um, so unlike its bordering neighborhoods, the waterfront is currently home to very few residents and many, many businesses. Um, given Jennifer's awesome framing, how do you all think this dynamic impacts the culture and the preservation of the waterfront? We'll start light and then we'll get into the weeds. <laughs> and popcorn style, um, I may call on you all later for some of those questions that I really, really want to ask, but um, you all can just start in whatever order makes sense. Okay, I'll try to jump in just to get things going. Uh, so this is Leonard Forsman. I'm chairman of Squamish Tribe and I was former director of Squamish Museum and also an archeologist and historian um, for several years. Um, I, I th think that that's been the state of affairs where, you know, by looking at the, um, the presentation, it's this industrialized waterfront. That was the first priority. And it's since trying to transform and we're involved in trying to transform it. Um, you know, it's, it, it, I was just thinking about, you know, walking by and say, God, it's, this must be pretty um, cool to live down here. And you see those homes. I, thought, I can never afford that. But, uh, that's just something that's there, but it's, it just reminded me when um, some of the housing up by the market is for low income. And uh, I remember hearing one planner uh, say, how we're building these multi-million dollar homes for low income people. And I says, I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, you know, the, all these efforts to try to, you know, people the waterfront are continuing on and it is a challenge. So I, I'll just start out there and let, let it roll. Awesome. Thank you, Chairman Forsberg. I'd, I'd, I'd piggyback on that. Like, it it is a, it is a, our waterfront has kind of been devoid of people for a long time, right? Because I think when we think about any city, and with Seattle, our best spaces are are public places that people want to be in, and we build great places that that the community wants to be in. Then visitors and tourists will follow. But on the waterfront, we didn't have community spaces. So when we think about the waterfront, most of what we're thinking about really is the private stuff that's down there. And it's target. it has historically been targeted at visitors and tourists and not locals for that reason. So what I think is really, really cool is like our past impression of the waterfront is private focused because there was no, there was very little public. And so what I think is really exciting about this new chapter yeah. in the waterfront's life 
is um, with this vision, we will finally have public space. And so, so that pendulum is gonna swing back towards the public. Like the community that lives here will enjoy the waterfront more. Um, and so I think we will have that place. And, and clearly there's a lot of attempts to have residential you know, throughout downtown. So there will be people to draw on um, in the immediacy and maybe a little more distant and using transit. But I do think that the pendulum will swing towards the local. But what I think will be really interesting is to see how the private responds to that. You know, does it stay so tourist focused or will the private start to respond more to the local and in doing so serve both? But right now it is a bit of a monoculture that does seem to be visitor focused. So I dream the dream that with public space and public awesomeness, um, will become a more public place that's representative of the community and not just visitors to the community. Yeah. Um, I mean, so first off, hash to talk here, uh Abba us, Shirley Cleveland, Yakha Abba us, Sarah Ward. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jordan Remington. I am a member of the Ward Woodra family of the Kuli tribe. Um, and yeah, as mentioned, I am the Community Engagement Programs Coordinator at Friends of Ward from Seattle. Um, I am also a visual and performance artist um, in the city. And so yeah, just kind of echoing kind of like what's been said, just like Leonard mentioned how industrialized the waterfront has become because of sort of the businesses that were down there. And then sort of in that void as it became less sort of industrial and that the only thing really to sort of fill that space was sort of tourism. Um, and so hopefully, and I think that sort of led, I mean, we'll probably get into this more later, but sort of led to the waterfront, like its view on sort of like local Seattle culture, both native and, you know, just more broadly Seattle culture has been very much through a lens of like that sort of touristy lens. Um, so it definitely creates like a certain image representation of the city that is not always the most accurate. Um, and so hopefully as it sort of becomes more people oriented and hopefully can become a hub for the more local community that can sort of, it can represent a more sort of authentic view of Seattle's cultures. You all are so good. It's almost like you got the questions ahead of time. Um, and we actually, I mean, that was great because it, it did address one of them, but I want, while we're here, um, I want to dive into something kind of specific about, you know, the waterfront changing and, um, this like local presence and local buy-in. So, um, and we're getting into a, a, a meaty question. So this, this whole program, History Collective, a recurring theme of the program, as we've talked about different neighborhoods, both, um, Chinatown International District and the Central District has been a theme of, honestly, uh, displacement. It comes up every time. Um, and it's a reality of our history in Seattle, um, especially for people of color and Black folks and Indigenous folks who are moved out um, and around quite a bit. So as the waterfront continues to like take this new shape, um, and thank you, Jennifer, again, for the visual aids there, how can the collective we, you know, thwart this further displacement and, and diminishing of Duwamish and Suquamish presence on the waterfront. I know that's like super specific and we were kind of talking about, you know, all of us um, in the Seattle area, but I do think that this is, I want to, I want to hear, I want to learn some stuff. <laughs> well, it's a very complex, complex question, of course, um, when you talk about this, especially in regards to the tribes in the area. Um, but I do think that the industrialization and the disconnect between the water and the shoreline have created a void for us. And I think Jordan understands, you know, it's like there's no beach, you know, where are the rocks, where's the sand, where does, where's the, where's the interface? So we're out here and you just walk over and look at the water and how did I get here? You know, and looking at that one photo, you know, we're elevated above the water. So it creates a bit of a chasm for us as, um, American Indians that um, in, the, in the, of the of the coast uh, because we're so engaged with being that being that being part of our experience. So not only the displacement, but this the physical transformation. Um, when you see a whole bay um, completely covered in um, you know um, 
displaced in its own right, plus the people who live there, of course. And then you get more into the history and how, you know, right around treaty time, the Indian wars that occurred around Seattle and the fact that that was been claimed as the city's part, um, that they really didn't want any uh, American Indians and uh, Suquamish, Duwamish, Muckleshoot, you know, uh, ancestors around um, the um, around Elliott Bay, and uh, that was, and they didn't really discriminate between that. So um, there were many of the some of the tribes were not engaged in that, and some were, but. Um, that really created this antiseptic almost like uh, which led to more things like banning people from selling their wares and del del relegating visiting tribes to one particular area like at Ballast Island, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, how do we repopulate? I think Salmon Homecoming is one event, but it's only one of a small part that we're fighting to keep, um, you know, engaged in. Um, and we're getting more support as we go, but uh, I think that that's one place. But also just creating places uh, that are more um, engaging as far as the environment's concerned. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Is that okay? Um, one of the questions I would have is, I've thought about this a lot, that Salmon Homecoming is tremendous. I mean, that's such a great opportunity to connect with people and learn. Would you, hopefully both, but would you rather, is it more important um, for Native people to have access to space where they can do their own thing, have their own uh, experiences and uses, or do you think that the Central Waterfront has been so transformed that maybe the best use of any sort of carved out space is a place to interact with the public and the community. Um, do you know what I mean? The, the difference there of, I guess, do, do you want a space that's more public facing or more reserved for private use? Of well, the I think both, um, you know, I think ceremonial spaces are extremely important. Even though the landscape has been just massively transformed. I think I know the answer, but I'm still curious about like yeah. the Well, you know, there's this whole, you know, the habitat benches that have kind of create these artificial beaches um, have had mixed success. I, um, I think they've turned out better than we expected. Um, so those are becoming something that uh, is an opportunity for us to create that kind of space. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and so <clears throat> also jumping in as sort of the answer of both as uh Leonard sort of mentioned like the cultural spaces like you know we still have a lot of traditions that we hold on to very closely that we don't necessarily do out to the public um and then also I remember listening to like Cole Thrash give a presentation and he sort of talked about if you look at the his like the historic photos of like natives down on the waterfront he there's this awkward thing of how there's always a line of white people up above looking down watching them <laughs> And so thinking about how do we uh, not necessarily perpetuate that all the time, um, I think there needs to be, I mean, A, like we're a very giving people and so sort of like, you know, we want to share culture and like, you know, make our presence known, but also how do we take the time to have that sort of internal like healing space um, along the waterfront. Um, yeah, even if it has changed so radically. So I'm going to, we did get, spoiler alert, we did get these questions in advance and thought about them. And then darn it, the conversation goes differently than just the question. So I'm going to give an answer that is not at all what I had planned. I might get to the other stuff. But one of the things that you, you said something, um, Jennifer, that, that I'm going to, I'm going to challenge a little bit because um, it's something, so I, I was lucky enough to be involved with the waterfront for a number of years. And I'm not now, so I'm removed. I'm, I know enough to be dangerous. But during that process, you know, I got to meet with, with Chairman Forsman, a number of other tribes. And along the way, I was also just, I was doing a lot of reading about, well, just about the tribes. And, 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 and one of the things that I learned, and, 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 and Jordan and, and, and Chairman Forsman, I, I welcome you correcting me or, if I'm wrong, but one of the things that, that the sort of like, I sort of feel like I learned in my heart along the way, which is we have this incredible bias that we, that I'm gonna call it a Western bias, which is 
we go down to the waterfront and we kind of look over the water and we see the things in the distance. And that is where we think that there is. But what we're actually, the reason why we go to the edge is the bay is amazing. The bay is actually a place. It is the landscape. And I think that's why we're drawn to the edge is it is amazing to be there. You feel its power. So I think too often we think, oh, that, that over there, the land, the edge is the place. And so I would challenge that. I think, Jennifer, the edge has changed. The edge is hardened. The place is still there and it's the bay and it's amazing. And I think a lot of us feel that when we're on the water, but we don't actually, a lot of us don't get it. And so I finally, like, I sort of felt like somewhere along the way, I kind of like got it. I was like, oh, the reason why I'm so drawn to this is the bay is a place. It's not a void. So there's, there's an answer to that is, is the edge may have changed, but the place is still there and the power of the place is still there. Thanks, John. Before I move us along, any other thoughts on, on this? You know, uh, well, you're going to realize I will talk endlessly, so you're going to have to cut me off. Um, but one other thing I would say, now I'm going to put on my landscape architect hat, which is um, since this, since we've agreed there wasn't much of a population there, it's really about how do we invite people back into this new space um, in a way with equity and with inclusion. And I'm really intrigued with that. And I don't know what the answer to that is. And I don't know exactly how it's addressed in the, in the current waterfront plans, because I'm just not that dialed into it right anymore. But what I, what I would say is you want to minimize pay to play. Like it is a public space with a capital P, right? And again, right now, the private has focused on pay to play. So how does the public balance that? And ultimately, how does the private res respond? Um, and then I'm curious because one of the things I jotted down in my notes was like, how does how we program and use this space affect that? Is less programming more inclusive or is more programming more inclusive? Do we do certain targeted programming like we already just heard about Salmon Homecoming? And so that is a great way to attract people who we want to get to the waterfront. But at the same time, I think with too much programming, it can be too, you know, it can, it can, that can limit the crowd. You can program things that are horribly uninviting to people too. Um, I don't know the answer, but I don't have to. There we go. <laughs> That's a great segue into honestly the next set of questions, which are literally having all of us muse over what you just proposed, Guy. You know what? What are some opportunities? And we can talk about whether or not we think that more programming is 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 a yes. Um, and Jordan, I'd be really curious to hear your opinion on this since this is a part of what you do. Um, you know, but the theme of this whole thing was, you know, what does reclaiming space on the waterfront look like to us? And um, I know in one of the questions I selfishly asked, like, you know, how does art play a role um, in like this reclamation? So whatever combination of what I just said and what Guy uh, let us off with, but I do would love to hear kind of everyone's thoughts on this topic. And I don't think that there's a right or wrong answer, at least not yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, as someone who uh, thinks about this uh, 40 hours a week. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you have to be very careful. I mean, like, I'd say yes to programming, but also having to think about, um, you know, who's going to use like, what kind of who are you programming for? Um, and we kind of know, like, um, you know, if you like do yoga and just like throw stuff out on the waterfront like you know, you're going to get a certain crowd of people so how do you sort of um we can't talk about like targeted universalism sort of like who is the least likely to come out to the waterfront and how do we use programming to make it feel like ownership of the space um so for instance like the first thing we were able to do on, to do on a pier was reflections which was like a native and black um dance festival that we filmed out on the pier which um just felt really good to have that be like the first thing to really um, happen in that space. Um, and yeah, so just in general, I mean, it's that question of like, where do you sort of put the money um, into the programs and yeah, making sure that you have, because uh, I think that's really how, especially for communities that have maybe forgotten about the waterfront. Um, and I think one thing to sort of bring up, even in this idea of like, it's an unpopulated area, like that's true of like very recent history. But, you know, if you go back further, 
the waterfronts are really our most populated areas in the region. Um, and so it has like that native history and that um, the, pop, the several village sites that were around that area. Um, so yeah, bringing that back to light and using programs to sort of make those reconnections. And I'll talk about art later. I'll, <laughs> we can pause on programs. <laughs> Yeah, it's challenging uh, to create a space, an environment, a, um, I guess, I don't know if it's probably an old word now, a vibe that attracts different um, um, audiences or uh, people into the downtown waterfront. So, you know, the people come downtown and usually they're up, up the hill there where the Westlake Center and et cetera, et cetera, where they're, you know, some of them go there. And then I'll think Seattle Centers also used to have a, a pretty good mix of uh, people, I felt, um, at least when I was younger, it seemed to be pretty accessible. So creating opportunities for a variety of types of things, you know, people are going to want to have something to eat, you know, but they don't necessarily have to, you know, you know, Pier 70, I don't know if there's anything there anymore, but I know you had that, that cost money, but you usually afford, used to be able to afford things at Ivers. Um, I don't know how, it's still relatively affordable. Um, but what do you do after that, you know? And, and I think that opening up that space um, is helpful, uh, giving people an opportunity to, um, to um, experience uh, a, a um, you know, a variety and a, of activities um, and programming, but there are th certain things that are, you know, stable at the waterfront. They'll probably stay stable, you know. We hope. I think in some ways. I, I mean, I'm the, from the older generation, so you know, my mom used to take me over to see, you know, the old curiosity shop, and and then also, um, you know, um, go to Ivers, of course, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So. There's a certain amount of, um, you know, kind of tradition there that's kind of old Seattle that needs to evolve. Yes. Oh, there you go. Uh, it's only been a year of virtual meetings. I don't get how mute works yet. Um, so, you know, I would, I would I'm going to put on my landscape architecture hat first, which is. Um, I think first and foremost, so program is great, but the first thing you need to do is have a space that is awesome as a passive space. Create a space people wanna be in and it will welcome events and venues because people want to be there. But if you create a space to be a venue, it's gonna be an empty venue when there's not an event. And that is a pitfall. Like if I ever work on a project again where someone says, we want an amphitheater, I'm gonna vomit because everyone wants an amphitheater that's programmed 0.5% of the time and it's a sucky amphitheater the rest of the time. No, say I want an awesome space that people wanna be in. And if you do an awesome space that people wanna be in, someone will wanna hold a concert there or a performance. So anyways, there's, boy, I got, I got passionate about that. So that's the first thing is don't use program as a substitute for good design because too often it is actually, we have so many horrible urban spaces that are broken and we try to, and then program is the only way we can fix them. It's like, well, the space is terrible, but maybe we can do something cool there that people will wanna be here. So let's be a little smarter than that. And fortunately, I think the waterfront is doing that. Okay, so Pier 62, eventually 63 was, was mentioned. And I, I would say this, um, the pier is like ridiculously simple and along the way there were so many design proposals for that and they would have been really cool um, but there was it cost too much I'm making this up because I don't know if this is entirely true but for a long time budget was an issue and then but the point is it's open now and it is so simple that it's brilliant because what is brilliant about 6263 is it's not trying too hard and it's like it's this calm space and it is about that power of the place. You do get to experience the bay. You do get to look westward towards West Seattle and the mountains. You get to watch the sunset. It's amaze balls. And you then you turn your head and you get to look at downtown as if you're outside of downtown. So the place is what is powerful and amazing. And it could have been uh, really messed up and over-programmed and over-junked up. 
And I'm so glad that for whatever reason, it became as simple as it is. And then the floating dock is amazing. So I love it for its simplicity. I love it for its ability to welcome flexible and pop-up programming. But I think that that it should not be over-programmed. There should be plenty of time where it is just a chill place to be. And then like, and, and I will make a stake in the sand here and I can say this because I, I don't have a horse in this race, but I used to love the, con the summer concerts at the piers there and I went to so many of them, it was so cool. But I would be really sad if that came back because I think taking away public access to that space um, for, two to three months out of the year would be a, a real loss to the majority of the city. And I will say, I went down there, I, I work in the Pike Place market and I, I, I go down there on my walk, I watched the whole thing get built. And then one day when it opened up, it was like, ah, and I took my family down there the next day and the whole edge was lined. And then I went back there later in the night and everyone was already squidding. And the crowd that was there was diverse and amazing. Anyways, I'm rambling. Don't overprogram. There we go. I mean, but that's actually a great segue into this next discussion about design. Um, and, you know, we've learned a lot, right, from uh, our years of doing various things to this waterfront. And Jennifer, the last image that you showed us when you um, walked us through kind of the evolution of the waterfront with the grass and all of that, um, speaking to, to some of your points, Guy, like, in terms of the design decisions that we're making now um, and their impact on current use, future use programming, um, you know, whether or not us Seattleites have buy-in or, or feel like the waterfront is ours. I guess, Jennifer, I'd love to get your opinion on, on this topic. Like, you know, how, what do you think about the design decision, decisions that are being made? Um, and as we're kind of having this debate about, you know, gas break for programming, uh, how do you think, what are your thoughts on that relationship between where we're going and kind of what we hope the space will be for shared communities? I, th I think I fall in line with Guy that um, the, the more flexible the space, the better. The, um, what I love about Pier 6263 is that it succeeds at what literally there's been five different waterfront plans for how to transform the waterfront since World War II. All of them have tried to get people to the water. That's been the goal. And it's always been intended that you could go around the transit sheds on the piers that are still standing and get to the water. Those are supposed to be public spaces, but they don't feel like it. They feel like working spaces where you, where you will be in the way. And all of a sudden that intent, that reconnecting people with water is succeeding in that space. And I also love that it holds on to the footprint of the original transit sheds, which are like old barns. They're very hard to maintain and to find new uses for. But what I always hope people understand since so much of it is gone is the scale of those piers, you know, those steamship size transit sheds were so enormous. And you can sort of get that feel when you go into Miner's Landing now, but you don't get the cavernous feel. But on that open pier, you get that open feel. And um, so I think that you get sort of a win-win there where you have the goals that you're trying to achieve for the future, but also hanging on to that piece of the past that, you know, I, I just think it's good to know what we did and why, and, you know, that mechanism for decision-making so that it makes sense and people can understand it and do what they will with that information, but just not lose that. And um, it's not exactly answering your question, but that's kind of what I'm excited about for Pier 62, 63. And then the larger design, I'm just really happy that it's gonna be more human scaled and quieter. Um, it'll feel like a place where you want to be, I think. And so I'm, I'm hopeful about that. Although I do have to say I'm jaded knowing the history of all the planning, but this, this plan has gotten by far farther along than any of the others. So I will give it the benefit of the doubt. Thank you. And Jordan, I wanna come back to art. Um, <laughs> Cause I know that you, you paused on programming, but I, do, I like art, I like public art. Um, and so yeah, how, how does art play a role um, in this, you know, 
current future um, evolution of the waterfront and reclaiming space and connecting community and 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 all the things that we've talked about tonight uh yeah that could be a whole other this could be a whole artist talk of how art saves the waterfront uh, <laughs> but yeah um yeah i mean seattle has a long history i mean especially when you kind of start thinking about like native art seattle has a very long history of um either really troubling history in terms of like stealing totem poles from the north um you know really using a lot of alaskan art styles and not really um giving room to the actual like more local coast salish art styles um and so thinking about that especially um, in a public space of how do you sort of uh, keep that in the minds of people like when they come here how do you give them that this is what the native people here actually are despite what you might have thought originally um yeah and then just kind of thinking about how do you show also the breadth of native art in terms of that which it's not all just this kind of idealized traditional like what people not necessarily giving people what they expect to see in native art but also like what it actually is in the wide breadth from including more contemporary stuff um and kind of trying to show us as a modern people especially within sort of this like urban context um yeah and then, i mean as much as like i and i'm sure a lot of other Native people would love to just be doing our thing on the pier every single day um, and representing our people. Uh, I'm a busy person. I can't be there every single day <laughs> doing my stuff. Um, so in ways like public and temporary art can sort of create a more rooted constant presence on the waterfront of showing that sort of, and can reflect the history, not just of native people, but a lot of people have histories on the waterfront, um, including members from the CID, from the central district, um, and so like permanent art work, permanent and temporary can also be ways of sort of reflecting those histories and making them known. Thank you. you know, I, one thing I was gonna chime in on the art front, um, it's like a super passion of mine is, is the role of arts in public spaces. Um, and I think art, straight up bias, art is the best program. Uh, and I think that, um, there's, there's a, the waterfront as a project has done a really great job baking art into the plan and with some very deliberate artist selections and trying to provide diversity in those. And so there will be these physical elements um, um, and they're there, I'll, I'll say for perpetuity. Um, and that's great. And it's, it's, a, it's a first start. And, and I hope that every one of them lives up to the promise and that every one of them is amazing. Um, but this is where my own art bias is going to shine, which is, um, but then there's this physical thing taking space for perpetuity. And an amazing piece of art can, can, can pull that off. But a lot of pieces of art don't because they're they're there for perpetuity and they may not they may not reveal a new thing to you every time that you see them so i would just say i think the exciting opportunity for art for our waterfront is really what is the added art that is ephemeral and is performance and will take let you see a place that you've been to a million times before in a new light and that's, that's the real power of art is it's not just a, something physical that occupies, physical and inanimate that occupies the space. Art, art, art isn't a product, art is a process. And I think letting the process shine on the waterfront um, would be amazing. So I'm rambling, I could, I could do a separate hour on art, but I'm done. I'm gonna mute myself. Muting. Um, Chairman Forsman and Jennifer, any thoughts on that? This is actually going to be our last question because we've got some um, um, questions from the audience and I want to make sure that we get to those too. Right. I just, I'm on the Friends of Waterfront Seattle and um, have been involved for a few years. And um, there is art proposed and being um, commissioned, a lot of it Salish, which is overdue. Um, but I, I think it's important to recognize the urban Indian population of Seattle a long history of advocacy for Indian people in, in Seattle and also, also you know, <clears throat> excuse me, advocated for 
um, tribal sovereignty of the local tribes too. So um, I just want to make sure that's that's noted, and and also the fact that I'm hoping that the you know my, one of my one of the cool ideas is that you connect Pike Place Market, the waterfront, and Pioneer Square. And I, I hope that happens. I, I think, of course, removing the viaduct has done a great job of that. And as we move into that space, I think that that's really important as well that they be, <clears throat> become more synchronized. I, I'm hoping that um, it, there will be some opportunities to maybe use art to explore some of the less beautiful parts of the waterfront um, work. I, I know that there's some plans to incorporate labor and the story of the work that was done on the waterfront, but it was such an important working place. And I hope that that doesn't get lost um, because it's, it's absolutely fascinating stories. Um, the other thing that I hope that maybe art could help us most effectively address is sort of the um, the hard parts, the uh, Chinese exclusion, uh, the Japanese incarceration, the folks from Bainbridge Island were brought um, across on the ferry and then they crossed over the waterfront to get to the train um, to be shipped out for the camps. And then um, Ballast Island, I think is a hard story to really understand and tell very well. And um, I'm wondering if art is a way that we can capture the meaning of those incidents and those experiences um, and give people an opportunity to mark it and remember it and not have it kind of disappear in the next beautiful thing that's happening on the waterfront. So, and I, I think that, that art might be the best way to do that just because it is so complex to tell those stories and um, artists can do that so well, so. Well said, all of you. Thank you. So that concludes this part where I ask you the questions or really we, I listen to all of your awesome insights. We do have some audience questions and I know that we're not going to get to all of them, so I apologize in advance, everyone. Um, but I will start off with this one. Uh, can you discuss how containerization changed the structure of the waterfront? And I think, Jennifer, you, <laughs> um, I'm going to toss this one your way. I love containerization. Um, so the most important thing about containerization is that when that was introduced in Seattle, it was 1964 was the first containerized ship went out of Pier 46, that's now part of Terminal 46, is that um, right away, this the reason that it's at Terminal 46 or it was at Pier 46 is that there was nowhere on the central waterfront that there was enough room to move containers. They couldn't be moved through the transit sheds like the um, bales and boxes and barrels of um, cargo that came off of uh, the traditional ships. Instead, they were this incredibly large object that had to be handled with cranes. And so it moved off the central waterfront and it was so rapid. It's just it, the switch, it was the Vietnam War was part of the reason that that switched so quickly, but also just the economy of scale had a tremendous impact. And so you see the central waterfront become almost um, lost in what is its intent and purpose if it can't move cargo anymore. And the fish processors hung on for much longer. They held on actually till the 90s. But uh, most of the uh, cargo handling moved off to the waterfront with containerization. And that's where you get the whole development of the South Bay and um, that um, even stronger severing of the ties between the river and the central waterfront, sort of that the bay experience was changed really significantly there. Thank you. Anyone else have thoughts on that question? Okay, I'll read the next one. Um, so I know we talked about this a bit, but this one is, uh, I guess we can give some specific opinions. Um, so what thoughts do you all have about the impact of tourism and cruise ships? Uh, it reads swamping the waterfront to the point that um, residents can't really use it. I think that the Port of Seattle, of course, is promoting this and off sea, there's a lot of industry related to the cruise ship industry, but it is creating a... Uh, 
Um, it is a big challenge. I think there's environmental challenges with it. I think there's also cultural challenges with it. Um, but I think there's also opportunities. <clears throat> if you've ever, you know, maybe try to strike up a conversation with any of the cruise ship passengers are from all over the country um, in, in pretty large um, numbers. So the opportunity for, you know, education is is pretty high. I don't know what the demand is, but I think that there is an opportunity there as well. But um, I think it's a good point that we don't want the waterfront transformed into a service area for cruise ships. I would, I would chime in a couple of things like take aside issues with the cruise ship industry in general, because there are some. Um, uh, but I do think it's interesting. So I'm in the market and um, and it gets crazy in the summer when there's cruise ships. So last year was a bit of a reprieve, but I don't mind the crazy. Like that's what I sign up for. I like that diversity. I like that nuttiness. And while I don't go on cruises, I do travel and I'm part of that craziness in other parts of the world. And so um, I love it when I get my market back in October and November, but I also don't mind it when it's crazy in the summer. I think it's okay. So taking away issues that cruises need to solve, um, I don't mind uh, a, big, a big push of people visiting because they want to experience and learn about this place. And sometimes I'm that person in other worlds, not on cruises, but still. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're all tourists at some point in time in our lives. <laughs> um, and I've definitely been to cities where I'm like, ooh, this is a touristy part of town. Um, but I think, I mean, it presents challenges and if it becomes a barrier to people coming down, like we wanna make sure that it is still a space for locals to like come down to and like that they have a reason for them to be there. Um, but also at the same time, if we can use that and sort of leverage it to also give tourists like a more authentic view of Seattle, um, it can sort of be a plus plus. Also now if the new park, hopefully there'll be room for both. <laughs> awesome. And I have a feeling that this will be the last question just because I want to keep us on time. Um, and I'm choosing this one because it um, is essentially a call to action for all of us. So. Um, it was originally directed at Leonard, but I would love to hear from all of you. So the question is about the environment, right? And the environmental impact on the water itself. And it, it reads, um, wondering how you all think about the actual water as a part of the waterfront and how the collective we can keep it alive and vibrant and not full of um, waste and uh, all of the things that we, pollution basically, I'll summarize it that way. And I want to hear from all of you because I, I love an ask or I love telling folks how we can be better. And um, I want you all to tell us how we can be better <laughs> in this way. Well, walk down there if you can. Um, take transit. That's another thing. Because, uh, you know, when we drive our cars, we create brick dust and rubber dust and many things, and exhaust that gets washed into the um into the Elliott Bay and, you know, we have to do a better job on stormwater treatment um, and uh, from our roads, et cetera. So extremely important. I know during the seawall project, they tried to make an effort to do some things that would make it more fish friendly. And they've had some <clears throat> success with that because that waterfront is a near shore habitat for salmon and uh, very important part where they feed. Um, so when they're young and so we want to make sure that we try to save, uh, save that habitat the best we can. Any other thoughts? I'll, I'll add something, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, there's this, there's this desire, I think sometimes to think um, we can, we can, uh, that, that it's about restoration. And that's an old, that's an interesting word because it means like taking back something back to a different condition, but we now have a very hardened edge to our waterfront. That is a reality and is probably not going to change. So rather than being bogged down in the idea of an aesthetic of what great ecology looks like, let's be really smart and focus on what is the ecological, how can we improve the ecology of this place and use technology to do it and come up with unorthodox ways to do it and not expect it to be about um, 
restoring something just to an old condition. So I'm really intrigued. This is like a huge part of, of, of what I do. And it's just like how we know that enhanced ecology and enhanced human experience can exist together if we're thoughtful about it. And I don't know exactly what that looks like. For years, I've dreamed of like floating ecological islands that could be along our shoreline and provide a lot of the habitat that we no longer can have tied to land. It's a crazy idea and it's fraught with problems true. But um, I just think like, let's think differently. Like let's really, but and not be hung up on an aesthetic of what that looks like, but really focus on ecological function. Thank you. Jordan, Jennifer, any thoughts? You don't have to have thoughts on this. I would, I would just throw out there that um, get to know the water, um, the river and the bay and the history and the ecology of it, because then when projects are proposed, like the, I know that it, when you're voting on things, they, you'll, you, you'll know to support them. You'll understand how significant it is. And the more that you're connected to it, the more I think it will just help make you your own decisions in your own life, like driving less and that sort of thing. So that you, um, that connection I think will help kind of get us to a better place because we are awfully disconnected from the water even though we live on it and enjoy it so much. Yeah. As Somewhat similar, you know, that this connection. Um, I mean, hopefully people being able to get down to the water and experience it more, hopefully will be more prominent in their minds. Um, yeah, and just, you know, we oftentimes think of in dichotomies of like urbans and sort of the nat natural environment, but I mean, everywhere, but especially in Seattle, you know, they intermix. And so uh, keeping that in mind. Um, yeah, and then as Leonard had said, you know, one of the, big issues with like salmon these days is runoff coming off the roadways. So truthfully, if you can drive less, amazing. Um, if you can figure out ways to filter that, you know, as well. Awesome. Well, that ends our program. Um, thank you all so much for being with us. Final thoughts, Leonard? I saw your hand. Oh, I was just saying, hoi. Okay. Hoi, Chet, I'm finished. Yes, we're two minutes over and I really like to keep us on time. So I am about to end the meeting, but I, again, thank you all four of you so much for being with us and for uh, giving this audience and me um, some much needed wisdom about a part of the city that honestly, I don't even venture to very often. So this definitely is changing me and how I'm going to inter interact uh, with the waterfront moving forward. And if you, I imagine that most of us didn't take the tour, please, please go on the walking tour. It's awesome. Um, and listen to the playlist. And like I said in the beginning, I will share that out when I send the follow-up email. And my final final is thank you to all of my colleagues at Historic Seattle. Y'all are great and couldn't do this without you. And I appreciate all of you. Happy Thursday. Thank you. Thanks so much, Taylor. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> <laughs>